Hey, everybody, welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast, where you get to learn everything you want to know about addiction and recovery. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, co founder of Kansas City Recovery, life coach, and recovering alcoholic. To learn more about me, you can listen to episode zero on your podcast app or find us on the web at addictionunlimited.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast. I'm your host, Angela Pugh. We are recording in the awesome Tucson, Arizona, where I have spent the last few days touring a treatment center. And you guys know I tour treatment centers all over the country and check them out and I get to see their programs from the inside out, which is an amazing blessing and a part of my life. So we are recording late at night in Tucson. This is going to be a father's perspective on heroin addiction. I love to share those different perspectives, especially for our families that listen to the show that are struggling with this at home. It's so hard to know what to do and how to do it. And I just love sharing that experience and letting everybody know that they're not alone and we can all help one another. You guys know how to find me for sure. Addictionunlimited.com right on the homepage. You can leave me a voice message. You're welcome to email me, message me from addictionunlimited.com, send me a DM on Insta, whatever makes you happy, we'll help you figure everything out. So today's guest, I want to introduce Walter Wolf. He's an interventionist and a crisis manager for families also who are struggling with addiction and or mental illness. Most of us know mental illness and addiction tend to go hand in hand. So let's welcome Walter to the show and learn a little bit more about him. Hello, Walter. How are you? Hello, Angela. How are you? Thank you very much for inviting me on your show. Thank you so much for coming and doing this with me. Tell the listeners a little bit more about you and what you do. What I do is actually, I could say it was an accident, but it all started when at 4.30 in the morning when I get a phone call from the sheriff's department in San Diego saying that my son is not only being arrested at that moment, but also he happens to be a heroin addict. And of course, his mother and I had not a freaking clue that this was going on. I mean, not a clue. Okay, how old was he? He was 21 at the time. And you did, did you know like that he was doing any kind of experimenting, like marijuana, a little bit of drinking, anything like that? Not at all. And it wasn't until later on that we found out what was really going on since he had been in high school. But he was at the uh, University of California, San Diego. So when I hung up the phone from the sheriff, the, the first thing I said to myself, I, of course, I was in a complete state of shock. And the first thing I said to myself is, oh, shit, what do I do now? And then the next thing I said is, okay, what do I need to know? Now, I was very lucky because of the business I was in and the people that I know and the resources that I had. I have friends who were in the recovery community. Los Angeles is really, for all intents and purposes, the uh, center of the universe, <laughs> okay, when it comes to the recovery world. And fortunately, I have friends who have been in recovery, for some of them for up to 40 years, which tells you pretty much how old I am. <laughs> and they uh, fortunately uh, work in the industry, and they are people of the most um, intense integrity. And so fortunately, I had um, the doors open to me as far as what are the best rehabs, right. what are the best resources. So I could say that within 24 hours, my son was sitting in detox at Cumberland Heights in Nashville. I was lucky. But what eventually hit me later on was, what about other people who are not as lucky as I am? Right. What do they do? Well, the fast forward, at that time, I was running an internet startup. And I started getting phone calls from people people who I knew, people who were friends of friends, and eventually people I had no idea who they were, but somehow they got my name and they got my number. And they would call me and they say, uh, listen, my name is so-and-so. I heard about you and your son. I got the same problem. What the hell do I do? I got a lot of those phone calls. And because of all the contacts that I have in the recovery world, I started putting people together with the right rehab. And I started falling in love with it. And it finally dawned on me that this is something which I I was meant to do. And whoever thought that starting with something that is what you don't wish on anybody, right? all of a sudden it's just opened a whole new life for me. And it took five years 
for my son to eventually get it. I think what people have to realize, when you're a parent of a millennial, relapse is part of the journey. I've had parents of kids who I've taken to rehab and the kid will relapse. And the first thing the parents say is, oh my God, all that money down the drain, good for nothing. Well, in fact, it's the complete opposite because addiction is a chronic brain disease. And like other chronic diseases, such as diabetes, such as hypertension, such as asthma, such as heart disease, there's no cure. However, you can learn to manage it. And anytime you have that kind of a disease, you have a 50 to 70% relapse rate. And addiction is no different. And in fact, 60% of people who have gone to rehab relapse within 12 months of their discharge. Treatment wasn't a failure. What it means is this time you have to make some changes to the treatment to fit that individual better. Right, right. Now, sometimes it takes three or four or five tries to do it. In my son's case, it took three. But what it does is every time when, when someone goes to treatment, it gives them the tools to learn how to not only be sober, but to remain sober. It's just, it's up to the individual if that individual is going to use those tools <laughs> yeah. in the way that it's going to maintain a lifetime of sobriety, a lifestyle of recovery. so It is very much a lifestyle. I'm glad you put it in those terms, too, that going to treatment multiple times certainly doesn't mean that treatment was a failure. Not at all. And that, obviously, as an interventionist, you have those conversations consistently, right? And families call and they'll be so discouraged. And I don't know if it's ever going to work. He's been four times, five times, something. And I always say, I always say, well, okay, that's good. That's actually really good because we're getting closer, you know, because it is, it's not a one and done type of situation. And the misconception of it being a one and done situation is kind of what damaged even intervention work for a long time. You know, many years ago, interventions were more popular, a little more mainstream for a while. But I think people got upset because it's not like an interventionist does not have a magic wand, right? I can come in. I can help you figure it out. I can give you a ton of education. I can get your person to treatment. We can do that. That doesn't mean that we're going to do it one time and that it's going to stick forever. That's not what that means. Yes, I'm in violent agreement with you. <laughs> and I can tell you that there's so many variables that have to be matched, that have to be met in order for this to work. When people come to me and say, well, why don't you send that person to, to so-and-so, to such this place and that place? I hear that place is great. I always look at them and say, great for what? Or great for who? Exactly. Because that is such an important piece, just like you said, matching the person. I talk about that all the time. It, it is so important that you match the person to a place that not only can provide them the care that they actually need, but also in a setting where that person will be comfortable and they will identify with the people around them, right? Like you can't, this is the example I always use, you can't <laughs> send me to a wilderness program, right? Because I'm not going outside. <laughs> you can yeah. send me to the spa program and I will do great. I will no, be I'm a, a star student. I'm a big fan student. of tile showers as well. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, don't send me somewhere where I have to go outside. Just like I wouldn't send a 22-year-old heroin addict to a treatment center that's predominantly 50-year-old alcoholics, right? They're not going to fit in. They're not going to identify as well. It's so, so, so important that you figure out where the right spot is. Well, it's the drug of choice. It's how long the person has been using. It's also what are the social circumstances of that particular person? I mean, is it a trust fund baby? Is it somebody who works for a living. It says somebody who doesn't work, but is the son or daughter, you know, of parents who support that son or daughter or, or does he or she go to school? You've got to fit all the different variables for that particular person. And that particular person has to fit into the place. That's just socially the place. Now you have to start talking about 
what kind of evidence-based therapies, treatment does that place use, and do those treatments fit this individual? That's part of it, but the other part of it I have found is there really are four types of diagnoses. One is just straight substance use disorder. The other one is mental disorder. And then it's either primary mental health, secondary substance abuse, or is it primary substance abuse, secondary mental health, mental disorder? The Which one's the driving egg. the other? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And there are facilities throughout this country that fit those variables. The key is finding the right one. Then once you've done that, then you have to go ahead and say, okay, can this, how does this family afford that particular rehab? Do they take insurance? Does the family have insurance? Are they in network with their particular insurance? Can they afford private pay? Can they not afford anything? Because even though Let's say you have an insurance policy, whether the rehab is either in network or out of network with your particular insurance company, you still have to come up with whatever the balance is of your deductible and your maximum out of pocket. Now, some families say no problem. Okay. And that's up front, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of other families, they simply don't have the resources right. for it. So you've got to also find out, okay, which places around the country or in that family's particular state has programs for which they don't charge, or can they get Medicaid right away? Mm -hmm. So there, there are like, there's a billion different variables here involved. And it's the same thing with choosing a treatment center. And I think people don't, sometimes they don't understand how many options there are. There are a lot of treatment centers that do a lot of things and that specialize in a lot of different things. You know, there is, I feel like there is probably a fit for almost anyone. I have to agree with you. You just have to know how to dig and what questions to ask. Well, not only that, but the rehab business is right now a $40 billion per year business. What people have to really, they have to be careful of the following that they send their loved one to a place that is, has ethical integrity. So when you're watching TV late at night and you see this actor come on with the blue scrubs on and he says, you better call this number or else, you know what? A lot of people do that. Unfortunately, people don't know that when you call that number, you're calling into a call center. And those particular people who answer the phone they just want to put you down as somebody who they got to go to a particular rehab. And that particular rehab, more often than not, is paying that service a referral fee for you to go. It is really, really difficult to find out which are the right places for a particular individual. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I have no particular allegiance to any rehab. The only allegiance that I have, is it the right place for your particular loved one? Yeah. Period. And I always tell families that too. I'm like, just in honor of full disclosure, I do not get paid by any treatment center. It does not benefit me in any way to refer you to one place over another. Just Some so states you know. it's illegal, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you do? Okay, you, I know you said you have a lot of friends in recovery and that have been around, so you had people to call. When you got that phone call about your son, you had people to reach out to. Correct. To guide you. Correct. So did you say he went to treatment three times? He ended up going three times. Did he go to the same place all three times? No, he did not. No, he did not. He went... So come. what was that journey like for you, even knowing people? There still had to be some fear or trepidation, like making those phone calls. Like, I think it's pretty intimidating to call a treatment center, especially if you don't speak the lingo and you don't know what to ask. You know, like I have a whole form of questions that I give my clients, you know, of I questions do as well. to ask. So I do as well. How was it for you, like making those phone calls and figuring it all out? Like, what was that experience like? I was a complete A1 moron. <laughs> I mean, I was, I knew nothing. Right. Right. And I was lucky because I have friends who do know yeah. everything. And I started from the bottom. And, but what I, what I figured out is where he goes 
has to fit that particular individual at that particular time. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, and I can't emphasize this enough, from my experience and from what I've seen from my clients now, is that that individual has got to want to, you can always learn the tools, right? But doesn't mean you're going to use them. You've got to have that desire to, A, achieve remission, achieve long-term sobriety, and it probably takes about, so I'm told by people who are living this life, uh, three to five years to really think that, say, five years really, that you're living a recovery lifestyle. And these, I, and I'd love to get in with, into it with you when it comes to what kind of a treatment plan really should be pl- established, you right, know, in the right. very beginning. But it, but it really, I can't emphasize enough from my experience, um, how important it is for the individual to really say, okay, I've had enough. You know, I, so I I've got to think- do it now. Did you think that he was going to go one time and he was going to be better after that initial stay? You did. Yeah, I was an idiot. Yeah, without question. I mean, I mean, the first thing I did when my son (laughs) he relapses, right? And what did I do? I picked up the phone and I called my friend Cumberland Heights and said, "I got to send him back to you." And and he says to me, "Hey, you know what, Walter? I'm more than happy to have your son back, but it's not going to do him any good." He already has the tools. He knows what to do. He just doesn't want to do it yet. And, you know, damn if he wasn't right. He was absolutely correct. It took five years. So how long was it before he went to the second treatment? It was a year, or a year and a half. And he went to a phenomenal place in L.A., and uh, he was there for nine months. Nine months. Oh, wow, that's good. Yeah. That's long. Yeah, it was a long time in a phenomenal place. And then he was able to maintain sobriety for a couple of years, actually. And then he relapsed again. And he finally went back to the place. He stayed there for seven months. But this time he had already decided, you know, this is it. Right. You know, he'd had enough. I was the same way. When I quit drinking, it was the most powerful piece of the whole thing was really that I made that decision in my head. And honest to God, You could not have paid me a million dollars to drink at that point. Like I just was so over it. I was over it, but I, I was almost angry at it because I felt like we had spent a lot of good years together. (laughs) (laughs) It's time for a divorce, honey. I'm sorry. And all of a sudden it tried to kill me and I just couldn't figure it out. And I just felt like it was so unfair, you know? (laughs) (laughs) And, but I really did. It's like my bottom was pretty significant and dramatic too. You know, I had a, a car accident that was one of my ugliest moments in life, but that I thought I hurt somebody else. Was this during your drinking days or before or after? This was, well, this was... During. Rock bottom. I see. This was the end. Yeah. So I really did, to a certain degree, I felt betrayed. Hmm. I also understood... That's an interesting thought. I never thought of it Yeah, I really did. I couldn't believe it. And I also knew, like, I could trace every single issue I had in my life I could trace it to my drinking, really? everything, my relationships, my insecurity, my depression, you know, blowing all my money, like everything led back to my drinking. So I just hit that point that I was just like, fuck this. I just can't do it anymore. You know, I just wanted no part of it. And I really, I made that decision and I was so clear on that decision. And I went to AA all I knew is that's where people went to not drink anymore. I you didn't mean, know did anything you not, about AA. You didn't go to treatment? I didn't go to treatment. Oh, man. I didn't <clears throat> go to treatment. You're a rock. I just went to AA because that's where I knew people went when they didn't want to drink anymore. You're amazing. And I was done. Like, literally, I all I wanted to do was figure out how to live from that point forward. I, I did not. I was not looking back. I wanted no part of booze. I'm I, still I just, like that today. I just want to make sure of one thing, that your listeners, they have to understand that probably 99% of people can't do what you did. What you did is extraordinary, extraordinary. People, some people are able to do it, 
but it's extraordinary what you were able to do. Yeah. But my my sobriety literally became my full-time job. Mm-hmm. I lived it a hundred percent, you and know. You still are. And I still am, for sure. And I just celebrated 13 years the other day. Oh. So good on you. Yeah, it was um but it I I do believe that, that the most powerful part was that I made that decision in my head. I was not drinking no matter what. No matter how shitty I felt, no matter how much anybody pissed me off, no matter how much I hated my life, I was not drinking period and i don't know why it turned out that way i don't know i just that's how just long how have it you was been drinking me. i drank every day of my life for about 15 years 14 15 years you don't look old enough for that i'm 46 and a half you drank for how many years about f- almost 15 i'm sorry you do not look 46 years old so you're doing something that. right it was all the chain drinking and chain smoking I did all those years. Did you quit smoking? <laughs> it was as well? my fountain of youth. I did. I quit smoking. I was ten months sober and I quit smoking. Wow. But listen, I quit smoking because I was getting embarrassed. Hmm. Because I went to I got sober at a noon meeting. I went to noon meeting every single day. I was a bartender. My and goodness. so noon was my morning, you know. And I would wake up, I bartended well into my sobriety many years. And I would wake up every day, and I, the first thing I did was go to my noon meeting. So I'd be sitting there in the noon meeting where it's nice and quiet and peaceful in the room, and I'd be in the back, like, hacking up a lot, like I was <laughs> coughing, and I and I felt embarrassed. I really did. Yeah. Like, I just, I felt like everybody's looking at me, and it, it was just horrible, and I waited. I had thought about it for a long time, and I finally asked my sponsor. I was like, "Can I quit smoking now?" Because they say don't make, don't make any big changes your first year, right? Yeah. So I was trying to make myself wait, and finally, I was like, "Can I quit smoking now?" He's like, "Yeah, go ahead." And that was it. I threw my cigarettes. You away got his permission, and, and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> now, was yeah. your sponsor a male or female? I did. I had a male sponsor for uh, almost ten years. Yeah. How, how does that work out? How does you know? It was just. It was an interesting process for me. I grew up with, you know, I have all brothers. I have a very male dominated family Mm -hmm. and I just have always been around boys my whole life. I have a very strong personality myself. No kidding. I met my sponsor the first day I walked into my home group. It's still my home group to this day. I met Mm. him the first day I walked in there and uh, he was one of my favorite people. And there were him and two other guys. Is he older than you? Yes. I mean, as old as your dad well, he was, or... He was 20 years sober when I got sober. Right. You know. But how, approximately how many years older is he? He you? is in his 60s. Okay. Make, okay, cool. He's kind of, a, kind of a father figure. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, okay. very much so. Okay. So the, I always tell the story. is my three guys, right? And they were at the noon meeting every day. And they were 20 and 30 years sober. And I saw them every single day. And I was like, mental note. 20 years sober, 30 years sober, they're still at AA every day. Mm -hmm. So you just go. You just keep going, (laughs) you know. But I couldn't wait to get there every day and let them know I was still sober. Um, He is who I wanted to be my sponsor from the very beginning, which I didn't tell anybody, but everybody says women work with women and men work with men. Yeah. So I just kept it to myself, and I was – I was a good portion of the way through my first year of sobriety and I had just been doing my own thing and I had asked a woman to work my fourth and fifth step with me because I wanted to do that. They say you have to do that to not drink. And like I said, I was not going to drink. So I would have done anything, you know? Yeah. So I had done that and and I, I was just doing my best and I showed up every day and I was very involved and I was very serious about it. And one night, our speaker meeting is on a Saturday night. And he and I would always sit next to each other in the speaker meeting and talk, you know. And, I, you know, we had a pretty simple conversation. And I, he asked me something about who sponsored me. And I said, nobody. And he said, I'll be your sponsor. Wow. And I felt like my whole world just fell into place in that moment. Because that's who I had wanted the whole time, you know. But everybody said I couldn't have a male sponsor. So it literally changed my sobriety. I mean, he changed my life for sure. Does Some he know of, that? Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, he's a very important person in my life. You know, I just love him. I, I credit so much of who I am today to him. I always say my mom built me as a young person mm-hmm. and built my foundation. Mm-hmm. And 
Kev built me as an adult. Kev. You know, I mean, he's who taught me how to grow up. He is who taught me what integrity is and what it means to live with integrity. He is who taught me emotional maturity and responsibility and taking responsibility for my actions and how to be patient and compassionate and empathetic with people. I mean, he, I learned so much from him. It was just invaluable. Okay. So now with the gift that he has given you, have you been able to also share that with somebody else? Have you been the sponsor for someone and hand down the gift that you've been given? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say too, that I get to do that in my work every day as well. You know, I have men sober living and we get to have a lot of those really good conversations about life and, and all the things that I just mentioned that I learned from Kev, you know? So yeah, of course you give it away as much as possible. First of all, I can't tell you, I know that you and I just met and um, I have an unbelievable amount of respect for you because of what you've pulled off and the lifestyle that you're living. It's, it's remarkable Thank you. that you did this on your own and you did this with the help of somebody who obviously saw something in you. Yeah. And you know, a long time later, Kev did tell me that the only reason he said he would be my sponsor is because he had watched me work so hard for mm. all those months, you know, coming to meetings every single day, being a part of my group, having a service position, doing service work. You know, he just wa he knew I was serious. And that was the only reason he said he would be my sponsor. I don't know that either one of us thought it would span a decade. But <laughs> now you just hit upon something which um, I is a is an issue which I face pretty much with most of my clients. And that is people have to realize that sobriety isn't something, it's not like taking your car into the mechanic and like, okay, it'll be ready tomorrow at noon. Absolutely. You know, it, each particular person has his or her own particular schedule as to when it, if number one, right, it's going right. to work and when, and I have found that if there were one thing that I like to see as an overall change in this whole treatment industry is people have to have a one year treatment plan. There's no such thing as going away for 30 days and guess what? I'm clean. It's just simply not like that. And so that's why I tell my clients that if you can't go away for 90 days for formal treatment, Yes. There's really not much I can do for you. Yes, absolutely. But you have And when you get into when you get into just the biology physiological parts of what is happening inside of you when you get sober. Right. If you get into just those pieces, you will have a great understanding of how little 30 days does. Because there's so many things happening. There's so many things happening. Like 30 days doesn't even touch it. Well, I mean, as I understand it, I've had people with a lot of lot more experience than me, of course, who say, listen, by the end of 30 days, you're really just getting sober. I always tell parents that when someone, especially a child, is reluctant to go or in denial and then is reluctant to go but eventually goes, it usually takes around 30 days for that person to say, you know what? I belong here. I need to be here. And the phone calls that I love is that person at day 45. Hey, this is Ben. Well, hey, Ben, how you doing? I just want you to know that I love you, that you saved my life. Is it me? Of course it isn't. But the point is, this is a person who has completely embraced sobriety and now looks at me from a completely different point of view. Yeah. And that in itself makes it really worthwhile. When you know, if you think about it too... I think treatment centers really start focusing on your discharge plan about two weeks before you mm -hmm. discharge. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're only there 30 days, you've only been there two weeks and they start planning your discharge. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very difficult thing if you ask me. When I send people away, it's a 90-day program. Yeah. And I always put together a year-long program this is not necessarily Walter's program. What it is, is I want that. If it's a millennial, especially, my rule is that millennial does not come home for a minimum of one year. 
because you want that millennial away from his or her land of triggers. You gotta have a new set of friends, you have to have be part of a new sober community where the people there support him or her and him or her supports the others because everybody's invested in his or her sobriety. You know what I absolutely believe too is sometimes, this is not for everyone, but oftentimes it is really hard to try to get sober in a place where you've built up such a history of being a drug addict or an alcoholic because everywhere you go, people know that part of you and they know that history. And it's like you're fighting your demons all day, every day, everywhere you go, where when you go far away, people only know you sober. They only know that part of you. You're not having to fight the skeletons in your closet yeah, yeah. everywhere you go all the time, right? It's like you're haunted when you stay in the same place. Well, see, that's why exactly why you call it transition. Because you have to make sure that when one transitions back to, quote unquote, real life, it's going to be a life where you're not going to be, number one, surrounded by your triggers. But it's so easy to refer to, to revert to your old ways if you're not ready for it. Now, I remember one client of mine, heroin addict, 21 years old. I took him to a, for various reasons, I never like to take a person to a local detox unless it's absolutely necessary. Sure, because sure. how many times have you had a, a situation where, you know, detox is done after five, seven days, like, I don't need to go to rehab. Yeah, I'm always. cured. Yeah. I'm fine. Okay. But I took this person to, uh, there's a detox on uh, in the southern part of town and south part of town. And I remember <laughs> this, I should have known better. I remember when I was taking him inside, he looked around and says, man, this is where I used to buy my drugs. <laughs> so I, I mean, I'm laughing right now. I should have known. Uh, get in the car. We're going to the north part of town. Yeah, right. But, you know, yeah. And he relapsed shortly thereafter, you know. You, you really have to. He was to. right in the middle of his hunting ground. Yeah. No, exactly. So it's, it's locations. It's people. It's sites that really will... Uh, subconsciously so you know trigger these cravings in someone and he or she may not even be aware of it when it happens but it does happen so what you want to do is you want this person completely out of his or her you know home element and in a completely different location and you one thing that that person could do after let's say 90 days of formal treatment I mean, by then that person is in a sober living house and in an IOP or OP program. But when that person decides to either to go back to school, do community service, or get a job, that person is already part of a mutual support community, right. i.e. a sober living community. And did, he, your, did your son do sober living? No, that's where we made a big mistake. He, What he did was... At the first rehab, he did 30 days at the main campus. Then he did 60 days of aftercare, very structured. But that was the first time he went, and, you know, it just, he was just too young. It just wasn't going to work. But we didn't know it then, of course, until right, later. Right. But he ended up staying, actually, when he did get sober, he ended up staying two stays. He had nine months and seven months in the same place. It was a, a residential, basically. Right, right. And it really worked out. I, I have clients who stay in sober living, and I always tell them, you have to be in sober living for, and it's true, it's not just me, this is statistics, and these are being done by people who know a hell of a lot more than me, and you have to be in sober living a minimum of a year. What drives me nuts, and I have a client right now who is in a sober living environment, she's been there for three months, and she's already planning to get an apartment with one of, with her. I said, you're crazy. It happens a lot. And I have this conversation with the guys at my sober living. And I, I just say, you know, listen, if what you're doing is working, don't change it. If you're stable, you're secure, your sobriety is good, you're having fun, don't be in a hurry to make a bunch of changes. <laughs> like, just relax for a minute, make sure it's going to stick. You know, because, and I get it, like you do, you start to feel better. You feel better than you have felt in a long time when you get sober. Physically, you feel better. You have more energy. Your thinking is clear. You know, it just feels really good. And you want to get on with your life because you start to realize how much of your life 
you've you're wasted. kind of wasted, yeah. right? How long you've been spinning your wheels. So you do want to get on with it. And I understand that, but you're right. I mean, the one thing that we absolutely know for certain is the longer you are involved in the treatment process in some way, the longer you are involved, the better your chances of creating that long-term recovery lifestyle and obtaining long-term sobriety. And that's why that if you go to 12-step meetings, their chances of maintaining a sober lifestyle are, again, exponentially bigger. And it's just more fun, honestly. Like, <laughs> that's why I made, I made my friends, and I had a good time, and I had people to hang out with, and I just created my own little sober community where I didn't feel like I was missing anything from my old life. I had no desire to go back to my old life because my new life was really rich and full and fun. So I never had that. I just never looked back, you know? I never missed it. You're lucky. You really I'm are. I'm really lucky. Now, the people with whom you used to drink, are they all still alive? Are they all still drunks? Are some of them straight? I mean, do you ever stay in touch with any of them? Do you know? So everybody's still alive, and I think everybody is still drunk. Really? Yeah. And you've been sober for 13 years. Yeah, 13 years. January 7th was 13 years. You know, there's one thing I would like to say, and that is this. Alcohol is a much more dangerous killer than for what they give it credit. You know, it's so normalized. Yes. And it is incredibly dangerous. And a lot of people don't know, too, that, you know, alcohol is uh, the most dangerous withdrawal. Alcohol and benzodiazepines, right? Or anti-anxiety you just meds. called it. Yeah. The, I mean, it's the only withdrawal you can die from. Yes. And it, it's... But it's so normalized. That is correct. Everybody is desensitized to it. You can go into a liquor store and just buy it. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. One of the guys at one of my houses the other day was a heroin user, shooting up heroin, right, six months ago. And he said to me, he goes, you know, I think being an alcoholic is worse. <laughs> and I kind of looked at him, I was like, what are you talking yeah. about, you know? And he goes, because alcohol is everywhere. Yeah. He goes, you can't get away from alcohol. And I was like, wow, I never thought of it. But yeah, it's absolutely true. You know, we've talked about it before on the pod, but it's, I mean, even like Starbucks is testing out selling wine in certain markets. Yeah, yeah. You know, Target in certain areas sells alcohol while you shop. Really? Um, yeah. I think Chipotle is serving beer now. It's like, I can't go anywhere. I literally cannot go anywhere where there's not well, booze. I, there, there are two points I'd like to make. And, and that is this. One is... I remember about two years ago, I was asked by a friend to come over and do an intervention. He owns a few houses and he rents them out to younger people or students and so forth. And he asked me to come over and do an intervention with a 28-year-old male who's renting one of his rooms. And he said he's an alcoholic and he's just drinking himself to death. You got to come over and help him out. I said, I'll be there in two hours. Well, I go over there in two hours and the kid is gone. Well, apparently in the meantime, his parents had come over. And they said, that's okay. We know what to do. We'll take care of it. We're going to take him home. Because they were embarrassed because of the, they still believe that there's a stigma attached to that. So they took him home. He was dead two days later, 28 years old. And it's all due to alcohol. So give us a recap on what is happening with your son now. So he went to treatment multiple times. He is clean and sober today. Four years. Four years. Nice. He has the most unbelievable life. He's about to get married, and I could not be more proud of him. I mean, he is he's, he's remarkable. See, this is why, to me, these are the stories that are the most important to share, because we are in the middle of this epidemic right now that is terrifying, and so many young people are dying. And sometimes as an alcoholic, I get a little frustrated because I feel like my people have been dying for a really long time and nobody has really cared that much. Yeah. <laughs> but with this opioid epidemic. Your people, but yeah, okay. <laughs> this opioid epidemic really has people's attention. So, but well, it's so important to share those stories where, because it is multiple treatment stays, right? It is a long-term plan. It's not short. It's not one and done. But to share the stories where there's victory at the end of the rainbow, you know, I mean, that's really, really big. There's so many parents out there and so many people that are struggling and in the midst of it, and they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
You're absolutely correct. When you are in a public place, when you're walking on a busy sidewalk, when you're at a sporting event, when you're at a park that has a lot of people in it, one out of 14 of those people have a substance use disorder. The point of me saying this to you is that this is so pervasive that it's more than just, you know, something that you read in the paper. You say, oh, okay, we've, we've got a huge, huge hill to climb here. Amen to that. Walter, thank you so much for coming on the show and doing this with me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you being so open about your story. Congratulations to your son. I'm glad he's on the other side of it and happy and healthy and living a good life. So for all the listeners, tell everybody where they can find you. Okay. It's WalterWolfAssociates.com. So that's Walter Wolf, W-O-L-F, associates.com and i'm more than happy to talk to you discuss what what your needs are i also will do sober escort and you know take that person to, to rehab as well perfect and for all you guys listening all of walter's information will be on his page in the show notes thanks so much for listening guys we'll see you next week you've reached the end of another great episode of the addiction unlimited podcast candid and honest conversation about addiction and recovery. Be sure to visit us at addictionunlimited.com to join the conversation and access show notes and links to everything we talked about. Love this episode? Please take 30 seconds to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes to help us improve and give you the information you want. Thanks for listening. See you next week.